Hello, this is Bob Carson of Carson's Corner Radio Show, and you are listening to the Missing and Abducted Radio Show, which raises awareness to missing persons, parental and stranger abductions, human trafficking cases, and giving left-behind parents of parental and stranger abductions and human trafficking the opportunity to explain their stories to the general public and their journey to find their abducted children. We have a case. Um, it is on Phoenix Colden, and uh, it's been a year, 11 months, and 22 days as of today that she's been missing. And she um, she was last seen on December 18th of 2011 at 3 p.m. in the driveway of her family, St. Louis County, Missouri home. Now, roughly three hours later, Colden's black 1998 Chevy Blazer was impounded by police after it was discovered about a 25-minute drive from a home at 9th Street in St. Clair, in St. Clair Avenue in uh, East St. Louis, Illinois. Excuse me. <coughs> the keys were in the ignition with the motor running and the driver's door unlocked. Now, the parents of Phoenix and Goldia Lawrence Colden strongly do believe in their hearts that their daughter is still alive and is out there somewhere and that their Lord has not taken her back just yet and that she will come home through the power of prayer, faith, and awareness to her daughter's case. Um, Now, earlier this week, I did speak with Lawrence um, over the phone about the similarities with these two cases. Um, And uh, if you could um, actually, Bob's going to be playing a timeline on this case here and that um, phone interview that we had earlier this week. Okay, so you want me to start off with the timeline? Yeah, you can start off with the timeline and then we'll go into that interview. Okay, here is the timeline for Phoenix Calder, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening and welcome to the show. I am your co-host for Carson's Corner tonight. And we're going to be joined by the parents of Phoenix, Colden, Lawrence, and Goldia. Back in December of 2011, two African-American women with beautiful, bright faces and smiles went missing only nine days apart. One in Atlanta, who was Stacy English, whose body was found January 23, 2012, under a tree in a heavily wooded area near the Aaron's Amphitheater at Lakewood and Phoenix Colden in St. Louis, Missouri. Now, in both of these cases, their cars were found with the engine still running. Also, in both of these cases, the investigation was slowed down because the cars the women were driving had been impounded, a fact that neither police department realized until several days into the investigation. Now, it is 11 months and 22 days later, and Phoenix Colden is still missing. She was last seen on December 18, 2011, at about 3 p.m. in the driveway of her family's St. Louis County, Missouri home. Now, roughly three hours later, Colden's black 1998 Chevy Blazer was impounded by police after it was discovered about a 25-minute drive from her home at 9th Street in St. Clair Avenue in East St. Louis. The keys were in the ignition with the motor running and the driver's door unlocked. Now, the parents of Phoenix, uh, Goldia, and Lawrence Colden strongly believe in their hearts that their daughter is still alive out there somewhere and that their Lord has not taken her back just yet and that she will come home through the power of prayer, faith, and awareness to their daughter's case. This episode is going to infuriate you, educate you, and make you question many things. Hello, Lawrence. Yes. Hi, it's David. Sorry it took me a little bit long. No yeah, so. Um, okay, uh, first, um, when when you were looking into it, when they were investigating this, I mean, did they see any similarities with this? I mean, what did they say? Well, they saw similarities in the way that the cars were, were, were found and the way the cars were impounded and the way that police department did not do the correct uh, procedure when they found those vehicles. Mm -hmm. Those were similarities, and that there was a similarity that the guy that was uh, visiting with Stacey English uh, the night before she disappeared was from St. Louis. 
and he went to the same school that Phoenix went to. Mm-hmm. So those are some of the similarities. Okay. Now, um, I I know that you know they ruled him out as a person of interest in the Stacey English um, case, but I find that very peculiar. Uh, yes, we did also. Yeah, very peculiar. Mm-hmm. And um, um, could you okay? Can you just give me a little bit of information about Phoenix? You know, growing up, how was she? What was she like? Oh, Phoenix was. Phoenix is what well, at the time she was growing up. She was very, um, a very happy, uh, mischievous, um, playful, uh, playful little girl. Um, at home, she she would um, like she would crawl up on the table and and tie my shoes together as if I didn't know. Uh, she was at at school. She uh, she was a very good student, but she loved to play and after school she would uh, play all the time uh, she's pretty good at basketball uh, uh, she was a very good um, uh, very good and uh, delicate young lady and she didn't have any uh, prejudices uh, about her um, she took ballet and uh, she studied piano. Mm-hmm. She's a very good pianist. Uh, she we started on uh, studying piano and ballet when she was probably five or six years old. And um, she became a very good pianist. Um, she didn't uh, stick with the ballet, but it helped her um, as she as she got older. It helped her in her uh, fencing uh, sport. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh-huh. All right. Um, now. Uh, when I listened to a recent show, um, now you had mentioned um, back on a show uh, a few weeks ago, guys lived in Bakersfield. Um, something happened then. She was about four years old. She, I was. Um, she was just learning how to ride a tricycle mm-hmm. with training wheels on it, and um, we were outside. Um, yeah, she was on a tricycle, and we were outside, and she was uh, riding. Now we had a double double driveway, uh, double entry driveway, and you could come off uh, the streets on both sides of the driveway. And I had a gate on the uh, highway side of the driveway that was locked, and she that's why where she was riding uh, on the, in the in the uh, double wide driveway and uh, back and forth up and down from the house to the fence and um, there was a car that passed by I was sitting out there uh, we had some yucca plants there that were enclosed in brick and I was sitting out there on the bricks when this car passed by and uh, I noticed it went up the street and then turned around and came back towards us and it pulled up there to my fence and this lady started to get out of the car but she noticed me before she got completely out of the car and she jumped back in the car and they sped off and I couldn't get to her in time to mm-hmm. to um, to uh, detain them but I got the license number and description of the car mm-hmm. the make, model, color and the license plate of the car but uh, they said they never could find the car and <clears throat> at that time there there had been two or three beautiful young uh, children, Hispanic children, had went missing mm-hmm. in in that in that area, and and actually one of them looked a lot like Phoenix, and um, I'm I'm quite sure that these two people were going to try and get our daughter at that time if I hadn't been out there in the yard with her. Yes, it probably would have happened. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, the reason why I asked that question and why I asked you to to tell us about it is is um, because I've I've seen this, I've heard of it happening, where someone tries to do an attempted kidnapping and it doesn't become successful, but years later they come back and they're successful. Uh huh. So okay. this is why I asked that question. And and uh-huh. another thing is, I mean, it happened with Stacy, and the way it was is, I mean, with the engine running and the keys still in the ignition and the door open but you're in you, with uh, Phoenix the door was unlocked um it was unlocked yes it was unlocked but not open 
but this is you know and and this just shows some of the signs of and I hope you don't you know take this to heart or anything or whatnot but it sounds like a case of of the, someone being grabbed to be used for human trafficking or a sex trade yes um either that or in 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 the drug uh the drug trade the drug trade yes and, yeah and and i think truth truthfully that uh that human trafficking and drug trade go hand in hand yes yes yeah yep mm-hmm. so um all right so what do you expect or hope to expect by coming on to the show tonight to expect to increase awareness uh of our daughter's missing and the the time that she's been missing and to spread uh, the word to get a, a, a wider audience uh, mm-hmm. to talk about her her uh, being missing. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, and um, we, you know, we uh, we have a strong sense and belief that uh, our daughter is alive and, and we You know, I was just going to say that too, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I yeah. have that strong feeling too because yeah. just put the similarities of the case and, mm-hmm. and uh, just the outlook of it. So, I look forward to being on the program with you. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you for actually thank, thank you for you. Uh, for contacting us. Okay. Hopefully, we can like I say, we can at least get the information out there and get the truth mm-hmm. out there too as to everything that's going on. Absolutely. And we're okay. back live here on Carson's Corner. My name is Bob Carson. We're going to bring tonight's co-host back on the line with us, David Levitt. David, that was a a conversation that you had with Lawrence. Uh, the father of Phoenix Colden, and we're fortunate enough now to be joined by, I believe, both of the Coldens. Uh, we're going to welcome them on the program right now. Um, hello, welcome to the program. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Um, David, do you, do you want to start off? Um, no, actually, go ahead, Bob. <laughs> yeah, I, we, we we just heard the the uh, circumstances of uh, this case, and, and obviously this is very heartbreaking uh, to anyone out there, but uh, just just kind of, if you would, give us a recap of, of what happened, and then I guess we'll go from there. Okay. Well, that Sunday, as I said before, was a very beautiful day uh, that my our daughter went missing. Uh, she left home approximately 3 p.m. that day, and... Um, at the time, we didn't know it. Her car uh, was found and impounded a couple of hours after she left home, and we didn't find, we were not able to find the car until January 1st, and uh, she left home December the 18th. Uh, the officer who got the 911 call that there was a, a uh, car ab- abandoned uh, at Ninth and St. Clair Avenue in East St. Louis, um, did, he said he determined that the car had not been stolen, so he just had the car towed. And from my understanding, what should have been done was that he should have notified the county where the car was registered so that the police in that county could uh, notify who the car belonged to. Um, it was our daughter's car, but it was registered in my wife's name. So it was fully insured and licensed, um, so it, it was it was completely legal. But that was a big mistake made uh, by this officer, uh, which he, when he did not complete his his duties. So we didn't know the car had been uh, impounded, and we didn't find it until January first. So we lost two weeks of uh, investigative time. The Day after Phoenix didn't come home, which was the 19th, we called St. Louis County Police, and um, the first officer that came out, once he found out Phoenix's age, did not want to write a missing person report. Actually, he lectured us that Phoenix could do what she wanted to do. She had a right to be missing if she wanted to be missing. Um, She Mm -hmm. could be with her boyfriend spent the night with her boyfriend or whatever, or maybe with her boyfriend for a couple of days or things like that. And that is something that she had never done before um, living under our roof. So we knew there was something wrong with that uh, because you just don't change your character 
overnight I, like I, that. No, no, you don't. No, you, you don't. And we knew something was wrong uh, with that. So he would not file a missing person report, but he did um, call and see that the car had not been towed or it was not in an accident or uh, things like that. And he suggested that we start uh, talking to family and friends and uh, yes, to hospitals and, and things like, like that. that. And um, um, he left. Well, without him filing a missing persons report, then that just left us on, on our own. And we started doing what he suggested. We called the hospitals. We called families and friends. And um, we also, the following day, we called back to the St. Louis County Police and had another officer come out. And this time a lady came out, and um, she also ran checks on the license plate to see if the car had been in the accident, had been towed, and, and things like that. But she couldn't come up with anything. But she did file a missing persons report, and this was Tuesday. Uh, Wednesday morning, we received a call from the Missing Persons Bureau of St. Louis County Police, and uh, we were able to speak with the, the detective that was in charge of missing persons. And this detective also uh, ran the plates on the car and couldn't come up with a, any kind of a hit on the car. So the car was just sitting in the impound yard, and no one could find it. And that had to be because there had not been any type of report written up on the car. If it had been in the system, St. Louis County should have found the car. But they couldn't. At that at that point, we were still we we were uh, still flabbergasted before we uh, we could where we couldn't find the car and we couldn't find Phoenix. We didn't know where Phoenix was, didn't know um, where no one had, had uh, saw her and her car. And uh, so we were just uh, talking to friends and family. And uh, my wife created a flyer, and we took that flyer and mailed it to all of our email contacts and asked them to forward it on to their email contacts. Uh, she was talking to uh, TV stations, trying to get some publicity, uh, uh, some coverage for Phoenix, and couldn't do it. Uh, we actually hacked into her computer. She left her computers and everything's at home. We hacked into her computer and... Uh, and, and, and hacked in, like we hacked, we had to hack into her Facebook page and things like that. And we sent messages to everyone on her Facebook page that she was missing and we were looking for the, her, their help to try and help find her. Um, at that point, someone off of her Facebook page or through our uh, email, our emailings, uh, got in touch with an organization called Black and Missing. And at the same time, there was another organization called um, Illinois Missing. And Black and Missing got involved and, and uh, called, called us, and my wife spoke with them and told them. She told them that we needed some media coverage uh, uh, on Phoenix. And uh, they got involved and started speaking to uh, local media, and that's how we began to get uh, media coverage. The uh, Illinois Missing, they created a Facebook page uh, for Phoenix uh, called um, uh, Missing Phoenix Colden. And that's how we got the Facebook page uh, for her started, uh, because of these organizations who wanted to get involved to help, help find Phoenix. Uh, and since that time, we have had coverage uh, through all of the local uh, uh, news media, uh, we have coverage on Channel 5 in Atlanta. Uh, we've been on Jam Jambalaya's Mitchell show, um, Katie Couric and Anderson Cooper 360. We've had uh, some extensive uh, newspaper coverage, even the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, uh, Bellevue News Democrat, uh, West End Word. Uh, we've had uh, the Umsel newspaper uh, do coverage, um, a full spread uh, ad page uh, uh, coverage uh, for Phoenix. So we have had some extensive coverage since then, um, and we're still looking for things, and we're looking for wider coverage for Phoenix. 
to keep people to keep people aware yeah, that Phoenix is still so missing. Uh, it comes to a point in time where people begin to um, forget. They they tend to go on doing other things in their lives, but you can't blame them for that. But um, and that's why we need to keep more get more and more coverage for her so, so that we can keep her name in the in, in the. Um, in the limelight out there in in on face in Facebook too. Yes. 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 Um now um that Facebook page they you can just type in Missing Phoenix Colden because I know when people type in Missing Phoenix Colden we get up with your your wife's Facebook account and then of course the uh, the Facebook page. Um G- that's, it. Facebook that's it. That's yeah. it. Yes, that's it. So mm-hmm. it's so they can either go you can you can friend uh you can friend one and then you have a like page that you can like to keep up with what's going on with the case. Yes. Okay. Okay, I see. All right. And if you if anyone would like to they can on in on the search engine they can type in her name and you will receive uh the coverage from the day she went missing. You will receive all of the coverage that has uh uh, things have had. Okay. I, I have a question, um, and and this is kind of a real baffling to me is that they found her car, a 1998 uh, Chevy Blazer, I believe, yes. while it was running. Correct. Yes. Okay. Right. And even just despite that, the police officer who responded did not. Uh, Want to file a missing police report, c- considering that that uh, the car was found like that? Well, the officer who who found the car was an East St. Louis police officer, and uh, at the time we were living in St. Louis County. The officer who found the car said that he determined the the vehicle was not stolen, so he just had it impounded. Okay. Now the next day we called the St. Louis County Police, and there the first officer that came out as the one that did want to file a missing person report because of her age. Yeah, but it just yeah. it just seems to me that if you know you don't find vehicles like that running, and then you put that you know with the fact that you guys were contacting the police department, you haven't heard from her. Or, or anything like that. That uh, these all seem like like troubling uh, facts that that would would lead to you know a, a more seemingly urgent response from the, the police department. Uh, it, it seems like that. But the the officer who was dispatched to the vehicle did not know there was a missing person connected to the vehicle. We didn't know if Phoenix was missing at the time ourselves because right. it was such a, such an early time after she went missing that the vehicle was found. But his problem was that he did not do his job properly. If he had done his job properly, we would have had that car that night mm-hmm. instead of two weeks later. Mrs. Coleman would like to say, would say something. Yes. Okay. This is Goldia. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can hear you. Okay. The the police officer said that he determined that the car was not stolen. I would like to know, how do you determine a car is not stolen without contacting the owner? Everything was in the car, the insurance card with my name, which you're required to have an insurance card in your car. The insurance card was in the car. Yeah. The insurance card was in the car. And nobody ever contacted us. So how do you determine that the car was not stolen without contacting the owners? Yes, that is exactly. a question that has not been answered to this day. And today is December 10th, 2013. How do you determine that a car is not stolen without contacting the owners? How do you say that there was nothing in the car, which is what, the officer said to one of his uh, superiors, said that there was nothing in the car, 
And I have a long list of everything that was in the car, including Phoenix's prescription, designer prescription glasses, her Burberry scarf, some books, a magazine, an extra pair of shoes, some candy. She had some candy, a box of candy in the car, and a Ziploc bag with some um, lemon slices in it because she likes, you know, lemon heads and lemons. And uh, I still have all of that stuff, but the the lemons have kind of turned to dust. But I have everything that was in her car, but he said that there was nothing in the car. He was No, he didn't do his job at all. He had the car towed. That's all he did. He had my baby's car towed, and nobody ever called us to tell us that the car was there. And we did not find the car. Lawrence uses that term that we found the car. We didn't find the car. Somebody told us where the car was. We didn't find it. We didn't know where to look. We had no idea that the car was in East St. Louis, Illinois. We were I made a flyer and we were going around in, in areas here in St. Louis, downtown St. Louis in the, the area that they call the loop. In St. Louis. We were going around in areas where Phoenix liked to go to the really nice restaurants and stuff. That's where we were going, posting flyers. We had no idea that the car was over in East St. Louis, Illinois, on Ninth and St. Clair. I don't think Phoenix even knows how to get to Ninth and St. Clair Street because you have to know where you're going. There was construction going on over there on Interstate 64. You have to know where you're going in order to get to that location. I don't believe Phoenix took that car over there. I don't. No. But how do you how do you determine that a car is not stolen without contacting the owners? How do you do that? Exactly. Did they ever examine? I mean, the car for uh, for fingerprints or, or any other DNA uh, evidence? Lawrence, when the car was found when we were notified of where the car was I called St. Louis County Police and they put a hold on the car and I believe it was maybe Tuesday or Wednesday when they got over there and processed the car but when we got the car back uh, I saw some fingerprint dust on the driver's side door of the car but that's all I saw. I didn't see any on the inside of the car anywhere. But I was under the impression that everything in that car should have been um, should have been inventoried and bagged. Right. Exactly. It was inventoried. I inventoried it. Her mother inventoried it. I have an inventory of everything that was in that car. But the police do not, as far as we know, inventory everything because if you go back to the statement made by the officer who had the car towed, there was nothing in the car. And the point is, my point again is that the everything in that car should have been inventory and bagged by the police. Yeah, especially since you found it's way after and at that point, you know, uh, it, it was obvious that she was missing. I mean, it, it, again, it, it it just goes down to shoddy police work, uh, yeah. unfortunately. Now, have you had any type of, of leads? What has been the, the communication that you guys have had with, with the uh, the police departments? How, how has the relationship been, and how is the investigation coming along? Well, I don't think there is an investigation right now by the uh, St. Louis County Police. We haven't... Um, had a report from them in, in a long time. Uh, there were leads in the beginning of the case. People were saying they were seeing Phoenix in different places uh, in East St. Louis, here in St. Louis, uh, different parts of the country, in California, in Texas, in 
New York, uh, different places. Uh, they were seeing, they were seeing, they were seeing Phoenix, and they didn't pan out. So, but here lately, there hasn't been anything uh, uh, concrete as far as leads are concerned. Wow. So there we are, don't know. There are a couple of girls, several girls who look like Phoenix. Lawrence saw one girl over in East St. Louis. People were telling us that they were seeing Phoenix over in East St. Louis, and Lawrence happened to see the young lady one day, and he thought at first glance that it was Phoenix, but it was not. It's a, there's a young lady over there who looks a lot like Phoenix. And I have seen a young lady over here in, in North County, St. Louis, who – at first glance, I'm her mother, and I thought it was Phoenix, and I was wondering what she was doing, uh, where she was. Uh, it, it was at a store, and I thought she was at home. So I was going out, and the young lady was coming in, so I went back into the store and followed her, and that's when I realized it wasn't Phoenix. The girl is, is much taller than Phoenix and um, uh, thinner, much thinner than Phoenix. But when I first saw her, uh, took a quick glance at this girl walking into the store. I thought it was Phoenix. So there are young women around this uh, in this area who look a lot like Phoenix. So mm-hmm. maybe that's who these people are thinking that they're seeing. But but we have gone to to Texas. We've been to Georgia. We've been to New York. We've been to California. Uh, twice. Uh, well, Lawrence went one time, and I went another time uh, on on leads about Phoenix, and and I don't think anyone, um, any of these people who say they saw Phoenix, saw Phoenix. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? They didn't see yes. Phoenix. Yes. yes. I don't think they were were uh, people who were being malicious and sending us on a wild goose chase. I think these were people who were trying to help and probably saw young ladies who resembled my daughter. Mm-hmm. What do you, and either one can answer, what do you believe happened on that day? Well, we believe Phoenix went to meet with someone uh, to tell them that she was not going to be a part of whatever they had going on, and and they uh, abducted her. Um, she left our home under the assumption, well, actually, they're under the under the assumption of a threat on our lives, her mother and father. And we believe that she left trying to protect us. Um, I thought about it and thought about it and wished a thousand times that she would have had let her mother and father fight her battles for her, but she didn't do it. Um, that's how I believe they got Phoenix, is that they threatened uh, our lives. And that's how... These uh, traffickers and and dealers uh, get uh, uh, young ladies is because they they tell them about hurting their parents, or their family. Uh, they 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 tell them that they have uh, people everywhere watching. They tell them that they have the phones. They've bugged and all that kind of crazy stuff. Um, and I believe she was uh, uh, afraid for us, and and she went with them. And that's yes. I mean. I mean, talking with, like I say, talking with you, and then of course hearing on a previous show what had happened to um, that what you stopped um, from almost happening to Phoenix when she was four years old. Um, it was, you know, and looking at this case and how, and I, you know, I don't, you know, I know, that, and I just want, I do want to stress here too, also, okay, um, is you know, even though there was um, media made connection between Phoenix and Stacy Inglis' case, the Colons prefer not to link their daughter to her as they believe Phoenix is still alive. And this is, you know, looking at these two cases and how it happened, okay, that's what I truly believe is mm-hmm. her life was threatened. I mean, you know, I'm saying your lives were threatened. She, you know, she was threatened also, and it had to do with either drug trafficking or something else that deals with the trafficking. Yes. We 
we have had a lead from someone that that there was a threat. We have had a lead, and we have uh, this is from someone that we've talked to that they were going to kill us. And we and Phoenix has left. Uh, that Phoenix left home with every intention of coming back. She left home with every intention of coming back. Otherwise, we would not be able to see some of the things that we have seen, some of the clues. Phoenix, I don't think she intentionally left clues, but the things that we have found in her room, um, they're clues. They're clues. Mm -hmm. And, and, And there is a threat. It's in writing. And like I said, we've had uh, someone, we talked to someone who, who indicated that there was a threat. Well, we don't know who. Well, Has the authorities, I mean, you, of course, you've mentioned this to the authorities. Of course. And they're not listening. Or are they following up with that, you know, with what you have? We don't We don't know. Um at one point, they seemed to think that um, what we felt was a threat. They didn't think that that it uh, read that way, uh, and I don't know why they felt that way. They didn't explain themselves, but that was the way they were feeling at the time. I don't know if they've changed their mind or what. They have kept saying that. Phoenix ran away. That Phoenix ran away. You know, that's Phoenix, the thing. Phoenix did not run away. No. You know, I, I want to say this, and I want you to listen very carefully. I don't know why they want us to believe that they believe that Phoenix ran away. Because I don't believe that they believe it. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, I understand what you're saying. They're only okay. saying that so they don't have to. What's the word I want to use? But I see right where you're coming from. They don't want to be bothered with it. She's an adult, okay? She can no, go where I, she I, wants. I, I don't think that because we had a very we had the. I when I was passing out flyers in in the community, I have met several people on the street when they saw a certain name on that flyer, the original flyer, Mm -hmm. their response was, oh, my goodness, is he on your case? He's the best detective they have. He will find your daughter. And these are people that I've just, I don't know them from Eve or Adam, but these are people who saw this detective's name on that original flyer, and that was their response. But he is no longer on the case. He's no longer on our case. So I to say that they don't want to do their job, I, I don't I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true. I can't, I can't say that. Because that man, that detective, was working very, very hard. He and his partner were working diligently to find Phoenix. I know he I know they were. He came over to our house one night about eleven o'clock at night. He thought he thought they had found her. They had a picture of a girl who someone had, had reported seeing this girl on, on, on a bus and they went and pulled the, the picture and he called me late at night. He was so excited. He said, Mrs. Colden, I think we found Phoenix. I think we found Phoenix. I've shown this picture to the detect- detectives in the office and, and everyone we're ninety eight percent sure that this is Phoenix. So he said I'll, I'll come over tomorrow and, and let you see the pictures. I said, no, you don't have to come tomorrow. Come tonight. So he came over. He was perspiring. He was. It was cold. He was in shirt sleeves, and he was really. I could tell he was. He was uh, enthusiastic about what they had discovered. And he put the pictures on the table, and I looked at them, and I said, well, where, where's, where's Phoenix? He says, that's her right there. I said, oh no, that's not Phoenix. That's not Phoenix. That that's not my daughter. You know, if you don't know a person and you see someone who resembles them, I'm sure, you know, and he was really excited about finding Phoenix. He, he was so, he looks, he looked crushed 
when I told him, I said, that's not Phoenix. I mean, I'm sorry, but I know my daughter. My husband looked at the picture. My mother was present. She looked at the picture and says, well, where's the girl who's supposed to be Phoenix? I said, there she is, Mom. She says, no, that's not Phoenix. You know, but he and he looked so crushed. But he was really, really eager, and, and, and I could tell from, from his demeanor and the way he talked to me and um, reaction to to things that I was saying that he was sincerely interested in finding my daughter and the the detective who is on the case now and his sergeant they are also but we're not we just don't hear from them that's that's all we don't know what, what these people are doing but i can't say that they are not they don't want to find her i can't say that well I can't I'm, say I'm that not, i'm not no i'm not saying that they don't want to find her i'm just saying some of the things like like um when they say that, you know, she ran away. Yes. You know what I'm saying? That. Yeah. They it's it's they want it you they know what I'm saying? They don't believe that. Right. They don't believe that. Like I said, right. I don't know why they want me us to believe that they believe that, but we don't believe it. That they believe that. Right. I don't believe that they're they, I, I don't know why they keep saying that. They're saying either she ran away or we did something to her. The utmost Phoenix would say, Mom, that is the utmost of ridiculousness, that we did something to her. Like what? Love her? Give her everything she needed and almost everything she wanted? Mm -hmm. But other than that, we have not. That that is totally ridiculous. That and she ran away are totally ridiculous. Yes. It is, because I don't think she did either. No, she didn't. I don't. No, she didn't, and we didn't. <laughs> That's, I mean, but, but, but there, 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 there are things that, that we found and things that we have been told that leads us to believe that she didn't and that there is definitely a threat. There was a threat, and she she evidently took it seriously, and all she had to do was tell us. But that's, um, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. Um, Our first guest that was in on the, uh, that was we had on the show, she's actually in the chat, chat room, and she's saying her heart goes out for you, too. This is, I need I need a few minutes. Okay. Every day I wake up and I'm like, Lois, I go and look in Phoenix's room and I just this this is still going on. This is not a dream. This is not a dream. This is not this nightmare is it's, it's going on too long. And my baby is alive. She is. Phoenix is gonna come home. And I want everybody to pray. Pray for Phoenix. We need oh. we need to get legislation started where the local police, um, community police, state police can start targeting the Johns and the people who have the money in their pockets to go and pay for sex. Once we stop the flow of funds going to this sex trade, we'll stop this the kidnapping of our children and the ruining of our, our children's future and the future of this country. The money is what keeps this thing going uh, day in and day out. Uh, these um, strip clubs that are all over this country, uh, two, three of them pile up in the same areas and so forth, uh, these communities, um, a lot of them in there, the, the people who, uh, the officials who run these communities, all they're looking for is a few tax dollars. They don't care about uh, the exploitation of our females. Um, they don't care about the crime that comes from this exploitation and these men and women that are in these places who go out and and, and, and hurt other children and so forth because of what they're involved in. These are the things that need to be stopped 
in order for this kind of thing that to stop happening on a daily basis every day does two three four thousand of children in this country uh go missing right that is totally ridiculous go yeah, missing and, and it's a whole process too that, that takes place of of brainwashing these yes. individuals relocating them um and and i it's just if if she is in that type of of uh, predicament, um, it, it's I I don't know. I mean, it, but if, it, if, if if she is in that type of predicament, and you know they have these girls on the streets in certain areas, in right. certain in towns, and they move from certain towns to towns where they have these strips. If you know this is going on then the police should be on that strip, and every John that comes on that strip should be chased away. If they're not chased away and they don't want to go away, then they should be arrested, and their names and pictures should be in the paper the very next day. Yep. That will stop the money flow from coming into that area. And once they stop it around this country, where are they going to go? They have no place else to go. I think the sentencing should be harsher. I think the sentencing should be harsher. You know, there are women, there are grown adult women who will uh, gladly go into the strip clubs and do that or prostitute. They don't have to take young girls or young boys. They even take young, young, young men, too, for this. And if they do... They are endangering the future of our country. When you take a young lady and use her body to the extent that once you let her go and she's not able to, um, to, to, to have children or have a normal life, that is a crime against our society. That should be a crime that an agency such as, uh, say, Homeland Security should be looking into because that is endangering our nation's future, just like a terrorist. It is terrorism. It's the same as as in any other kind of terrorism. Mm -hmm. And our government, and we are the government, we the people. I'm sure you've heard that term, we the people. We need to stand up for what is right. We need to protect our children. We need to to get back to uh, family values. We need to, to get a lot of this filth that's on TV, off TV and off the movie screens. Whatever happened to censorship? Censorship was to protect the innocence. And now we don't really have any protection for the innocent. It's like anything goes. I I, I agree. Uh, um, and uh, you know when when you you hear about prostitution and the the different uh, websites available. I mean I, I remember a couple of years ago Craigslist w- was known for having a section on on its website that uh, offered adult services and, and the individuals that partake in these services are essentially continuing the the human sex trafficking trade and And that's still there it's still there if you've been on craigslist lately and we i have been on some sites believe it or not i've been on some sites looking praying that i would not see my daughter but someone suggested that we do this lawrence and i some of the stuff that's out there is unbelievable. Yeah. I'm like, Lawrence, this is a little kid can go on, on Craigslist and click on uh, platonic relationship or men looking for men or women, men looking for women and all that, and see all kinds of things that they should not see until they are grown and adult. But it's there. You can go on sites and see things that should be private, 
nothing, it's like nothing is private, nothing is sacred anymore. It's like, what is wrong with the, what is wrong with people? What is wrong with this world? Mr. Caldwell, I, I want to um, ask you, you had mentioned that it's been a while since you heard from the police department and you really don't know what's going on with the investigation. H have you at all uh, obtained or are you thinking about obtaining the services of a private investigator? We've we've had a private investigator uh, that came in, I believe, in February of 2012 and um, did a lot of work, got us in touch with uh, a lot of people that Phoenix was associating with that we did not know about. So he did do do some work for us, but um, he was unable to find where Phoenix is, and if he does know where she is, he didn't tell us or whatever. But he he uh, he I I just imagine he he did not find where she is. Uh, but he did do a lot of work. Um, he went a lot of different places, uh, tracking down leads and so forth. But he was unable to find where Phoenix is. The one lead that I would really, really, I would like to talk to the man myself, face to face, is the guy who set up the face, the fake Facebook page, saying that Phoenix was his long lost daughter. That was. Um, <laughs> I would like to talk to that man face to face because I would like to know from him where he got the picture that he used and that he doctored. He doctored a picture that was taken in our house oh. from at my mother's birthday party. I would like to know where he got that picture. And why did he doctor the picture? So we don't have a PI uh, working with us uh, anymore. We had one PI, uh, it was an ex-police officer who was working with us, and um, he decided not to pursue the case anymore. So we don't have uh, any PIs on the case uh, right now. We had but, we had another PI as well who came forward who was going to help us on a pro bono basis. Actually, two others, and uh, all of a sudden they oh. don't want to work on the case. I see. Um, I just uh, overheard what you said, Goldia. And, uh -huh. and you currently don't have a private investigator on this case. Right. And you wanted to know a certain thing. Um, I have a pastor who is a private investigator, and he does pro bono work. I just tried calling him on my cell phone, but cell service here is not too good. Um, I don't know if I can do a three-way call and be able to bring him in. Um but I could get you in contact with him to call him. Okay. He does pro bono work. He said he would he, he would do that. Okay. Um, no problem. Every 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 private investigator who has come forward to help us, even those who are pro bono, and the very first private investigator that we got to help us, the very first one, have all backed out. That private, the very first one who did a little work for us, finally, I finally was able to get him on the phone. He would not return my calls. I finally was able to get him, and his response was, Mrs. Colden, I can't help you. I said, but why? I can't help you. I can't help you. Every other private investigator since then except one has backed out. Except one. Except one. Including the private investigator who I think was involved in the uh, 
Boston bombing case. Mm-hmm. The, the guy, the, the two young men who um, had yes. the bombs at the yes. Boston Marathon. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yep. Including yes. him. Yes. These people have backed out. Well, backed do we know out. why? We don't know why. The one who I talked to, the one who I talked with, the very first one, all he would say was, Mrs. Colden, I can't help you. I can't help you. He said I he can could take, take our money, money, but he couldn't help us. But I can't help you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to send you his uh, phone number on your Facebook. Okay. Don't send it to okay. it. Don't do that. No, the, I, I will do it in the call. chat. When we get off the show, I will give you a call, and I will give you his phone number. If Don't you, do that either. No? Just send it to us on the chat. Okay. I'll send it to you in a private, yep. This is this this is a nightmare. This is the worst this is the worst thing that could ever happen to our family. We used to be happy. We lived a very simple life. We li- we lived a very, very simple life. We were happy. And then there were people who came into our daughter's life in our life, who were meddlesome, who, who, everything that we, things that we were doing with our daughter, such as my homeschooling her, they saw that as uh, a problem. Oh, you think you know more than the teachers? No, I don't think I know more than the teachers. I just want my, my daughter to learn the different parts of speech. I want my daughter to learn uh, about history. I want my daughter to learn how to spell words instead of using spell check. And I want my daughter to learn about the Bible. And I want my daughter to learn about government and how this country is supposed to be run. That she will not get from the teachers in public school. So therefore, I will teach her at home. We were getting people who were just meddlesome about things that we were doing with our daughter at home, which were things that people were doing, have been doing since, ooh, I don't know, since mothers have always done. I taught my daughter how to set a table. I taught my daughter how to make a bed. I taught my daughter how to keep her body clean. I taught my daughter how to floss her teeth. I taught my daughter how to to be respectful to grown-ups. I taught my daughter um, how to clean a house. I taught my daughter how to iron her clothes. People nowadays, most people, mothers nowadays don't even teach their daughters that. I taught my daughter about sex. I taught my, my husband taught her about sex that that is something that God created to procreate this earth, not to be used as a, as a recreation. That's what we taught Phoenix. We taught her that you're supposed to save that for marriage because it is sacred. It is, it, it is private. It is not something that you get a video camera and, and, and videotape it and put it on Facebook. We taught her not to watch TV during the week because you, that's, you're supposed to be studying. And we only allowed her a certain number of hours to watch TV on the weekend. And she couldn't watch just anything and everything because anything and everything doesn't go in our house. These are the things that we taught our daughter. And I'm praying that she is remembering everything that we taught her. The number one thing is that God loves her and that he is always with her and he will never leave her. Phoenix wanted friends. She wanted friends. And she went outside her circle. And she's very... um, I taught her that it doesn't matter what color a person is. I made sure that Phoenix went to 
when, when I did send her to school, nursery school or, or preschool, she went to a school where there were handicapped children. I sent her there so that she could see that handicapped children are just like her, except they have some physical or mental uh, uh, situation that makes them special. Not less than her, but just special. Therefore, when Phoenix would see handicapped people, you know how some teenagers make fun of handicapped people? Phoenix didn't do that because at an early age, she was exposed to that. She was exposed to Caucasian children, Asian. One of her very best friends when she was uh, little was a little Asian girl at church and Hispanic girls and, and, and Caucasian girls and black girls or brown girls. It doesn't matter what color you are. That's what Phoenix was taught. But then we had, she wanted friends and I always taught her that you seek your friends at your level and above, not below. But she did. She she was able to, being a non-judgmental person that she is and wanting friends, she, she uh, got some friends who uh, were not at her level or above. And I think some of those people took advantage of her. We're uh, actually facing about a minute left here. Um, If you could just give a website and give any information, any closing statements uh, that you wish to give to the audience. Okay. Uh, For any leads, if anyone knows where Phoenix is, all we want is our daughter back. That's all. That's all we want. Our phone number, Lawrence and Goldia Colden, you can call us. 314-653-6600. 314-653-6606. You may also call Detective Michael Moore of the St. Louis County Police. The number is 314-615-5400. You may also call Crime Stoppers, and that number is 800 222 Seven seven, or you may call your local FBI. All we want is our daughter. That's all we want. We do not. We're not the police. All we want is Phoenix back home. That's all. That's all. David and Lawrence. Yes. Yes. Um, do you have any uh, anything you want to say before we wrap it up? No, I don't. No, this has been kind of very very emotional, and um, I will give you a call. I uh, I put that in the chat room, the phone number. Okay. You. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, I will as soon as I get off the phone. I will be giving him a call, and to let him know. Uh, we've been talking about this case, me, me and him, anyways, and about it and whatnot. So um, I didn't think there was this, uh, this so much was involved. And uh, this was it's quite, quite, uh, been quite an emotional hour. Yes, so, um, yes it is. It's very uh, emotional. I'm going to just say every one thing. day. It's every day that it's emotional. Every single day. Every day. I know it is for you, Goldie and Lawrence. Yes. Yep. So we thank so, you guys for having us and, 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 and spreading the word, helping us to spread the word. Yes, Please, thank you. Yes, and, and you're welcome on the show anytime uh, in the future. Please uh, keep in contact, and we'll keep in contact with you as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Good luck. Okay. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, David. That that was, as you said, a very, very emotional hour. Um, yeah. And... Uh, this is going to be available on the archives really forever, so it's blogtalkradio.com backslash Carson's Corner. David, you want to plug uh, your yeah. Facebook page before we yeah. wrap it up uh, here? Yep, yeah. your Facebook page. You can actually, if you need to, 
you want to send me a message, if you do have a, a missing loved one or if you know someone who has a missing loved one and needs to and you're not getting much media attention you want to get out there to raise awareness, you can message me on Facebook at uh, facebook.com slash ndsman64 or you can go actually to my Facebook like page and that is The Missing and Abducted. I also have S Speak Your Mind Radio, The Missing and Abducted Radio Show, and also Recent News and Alerts, Help Bring on Missing Home. Um, and you can go right to my Facebook page, right on my profile, and all that stuff is right there. And right. of course, my okay. website my website is uh, SYMRadio.com. Great, David. Thank you very much. We'll do it again sometime in the future. Yes, we will. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for listening out there. Hey everybody, this is the webmaster of Speak Your Mind Radio and host of the Missing and Abducted Radio Show on YouTube and Facebook. Justin Harvey has always been a great friend to me, a longtime supporter and advocate for the Missing and Abducted, who works very hard with raising awareness and continues to inspire many people as he has overcome this cerebral palsy by hosting this show, writing a book, training under the legendary Grandmaster Frank Dukes and becoming West Virginia's first ever undefeated pro wrestling champion. The Justin Harvey Show is endorsed by some of the biggest names in the world of martial arts and entertainment like Frank Dukes, inspiration for the movie Bloodsport and Kumite champion. Mohamed Kisi, actor who played Tong Po in the movie Kickboxer and Tony Luke Jr., actor, entrepreneur, and martial artist. So I urge you to follow and subscribe to the hottest internationally known podcast around the world by going to facebook.com, The Justin Harvey Show, where you can like his Facebook page, receive a free copy of My CP Prison, written by Justin himself, for liking the page. And as an added bonus, when you subscribe to his YouTube channel, you will receive... Justin's cover version of Fight to Survive from Blood Sports, original version of Fight to Survive by Paul Herzog. recognize my name from the movie Bloodsport. John Claude Van Damme portrays me in the movie. Well, I want to introduce you to a real champ, a real comité, by his own right, Justin Ray Harvey. Enjoy the show. Won't be disappointed. All background music for The Missing and Abducted and Speak Your Mind Radio has been provided by me, Justin Ray Harvey of The Justin Harvey Show. Be sure to tune in on YouTube at Frank Dukes Fan for my official channel for shows and updates. See you there. Keep on rocking, David Levitt. This webcaster uses Radio Amber, the Internet Radio Amber Alert System, helping to keep your children safe. A public service from the Internet Broadcasting Community and this station. Hi, this is your host from SYM Radio with a public service announcement. We have an endangered missing senior citizen alert. He is a 79-year-old Cleveland, Ohio man who has been missing since December 7th, 2006. He was 73 at the time of his disappearance, and his family is asking to help find him. Willie Chuck Stanbury was last seen at two locations on Thursday, December 7, 2006, at approximately 7.15 p.m., near the intersection of East 89th Street and Grand Avenue, where he owns property, and then at the Shell gas station, where he got gas on East 123rd in St. Clair at approximately 7.45 p.m. He was driving a 2001 Hunter Green Ford Focus with Ohio license plate EAU8688. When he went missing, he owned three houses, was a gospel musician, had a girlfriend, and talked to his grandchildren every day. He has not been seen or heard from since the evening of his disappearance. His race is black, 
with black balding hair, brown eyes, 6 feet 2 inches tall, and weighs 210 pounds, wears glasses, and walks with a limp in his right leg. He was last seen wearing a baseball cap, beige jogging suit, and suede jacket. If you believe you have any information regarding this case that will be helpful in this investigation, please contact the 24-hour confidential information line at 216-367-9035. For more information on this case also, you can visit their Facebook page at Missing Willie C. Stanbury Sr. And for other information on all other cases, please visit us on Facebook at Facebook.com, Missing and Abducted. This has been a public service announcement brought to you by SYM Radio, J Ray Radio, a public service for the surrounding communities and the internet broadcasting community. The family volunteers and in collaboration with Speak Your Mind Radio, the Justin Harvey Show, and the Missing and Abducted Radio Show has created this public service announcement related to Christina Kluckner, who has been missing since October 1st of 2011 from Cleveland, Ohio. Christina Kluckner has medical issues, is mentally challenged, and may fluctuate from seemingly age-appropriate behaviors to childlike behaviors. She is considered vulnerable and in need of her medications. Christina also has suicidal tendencies. When Christina took adventures out, she was always accompanied by the family or caregiver. The parents reported Christina missing on Sunday, October 2, 2011, after last seeing her at 8 p.m. the night before when an argument had occurred. When Christina's father went to her room the next morning to check on her, he had found Christina wasn't in her room and her PJs were in the middle of her floor. In the morning also, the back door was found to be unlocked. The family says she has ran away in the past, but has always come home. Christina has a scar from a dog bite on her left ankle. The clothing that was missing from Christina's room is her black boots, black vinyl jacket, bling jeans, a blue jean skirt, a blue jean purse with a pick of Tinkerbell. Christina Kleckner was 24 years old at the time of her disappearance and is now 26 and will be 27 on May 27th of this year. She has brown hair, blue eyes, weighs between 180 to 200 pounds, and is 5 feet 5 inches tall. Anyone who has seen or has any information on Christina's disappearance is asked to call the Cleveland, Ohio 2nd District Detectives at 216-623-5262 or 216-623-5218. If you are afraid to call, please send me or help find Christina Kleckner's group admin and inbox. 